Um, so welcome everyone, I'm Amber Levy, AJLI's Director of Membership, for those who I haven't met yet. It looks like we have a packed house this morning, so I'm excited because that means y'all are here to talk about recruitment and how that can tie directly to our retention efforts. Love, we're not gonna write this down, but I'd love to hear from you all. What are a couple of things that you're doing well with recruitment right now that you would like to share? Things that are just going great gangbusters. What Lisa's talking about is their messaging on the front end. So they are not marketing themselves as a social organization or even a direct service organization. They're much, much more than that. And they're talking about that on the front end and really staying on point with the mission. Anybody else want to share? Get our new members engaged with our project right away, kind mm -hmm. of an, an off spin of what our bigger project is, so they get a really good grasp of what our bigger project is, mm -hmm. and then connect them with active members right away for that mentorship that starts engagement with members um, who aren't necessarily new members, Yep. but can connect with them throughout the whole entire league. Okay, great. So you're getting them engaged right away. That's perfect. So thanks for sharing. I think those are some good takeaways. So these are lots of things that we're gonna talk about now. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into it. Um, so you may be asking, okay, why is this important? You know, there is a direct correlation between how members are being recruited and the low retention rates. And so I'll get a bit more into that. But uh, you know, when there is a mismatch between recruitment and experience, members become dissatisfied. And let me explain what I mean by that. So if you're out there recruiting, you're leading with, uh, you'll, you'll come to the league, you'll meet your best friend, this is the way to meet people, and you're really leading with that social component first, then once your members then become members and they're integrated and they're doing some work and they're on a committee, they may be confused because that's not really what they thought they signed up for, right? So there's a mismatch between what they heard and then what the actual experience might be. Another way to think about this could be if you're recruiting on brand, on mission, you're doing all the right things, right? You're talking about how we promote volunteerism, that we're developing the potential of women, et cetera, et cetera, and you're walking them through all of that, but then once they get in, you're not delivering on that promise. That's also a mismatch between recruitment and experience. So this can come at you from either angle. The third thing here, attracting a, a diverse membership will require a strategy including intentional outreach. So we're gonna talk about some steps that you can take to become very intentional about who you're recruiting, not just how you're recruiting. Okay, so we're gonna talk about three pillars, messaging, intentional outreach, and onboarding. Okay, so messaging, there's a lot in that word, right? We could talk about this probably for three hours. So inevitably, you all are socializing outside the league, you're meeting people. At one point or another, you have been asked one of these questions. Tell me about the league. Why should I join the league, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna share a story with you. I, although I've been working for membership organizations for many years, I started with AJLI last July. And one of the first things I did was I got on the road and I visited many leagues. I think I visited nine leagues in four months. And one of the things I did when I got on the road was I asked the president of the league to set up meetings for me, in which I would meet with a small group of one to three year actives, a small group of let's say four to seven you know, year actives, and I would ask them this question. If they were in a position where they were at a social event and they were asked, you know, tell me about the junior league or why should I join the junior league? How would you answer that question? And what I learned very quickly was that there was a million ways you can answer that question and I wasn't seeing any cohesiveness with the way in which it was being answered. And it was very confusing to me because I was new to AJLI at the time and I really wasn't taking away what our mission was. And so this was an aha moment for me in terms of where we need to work together because you know, collectively this is all of our responsibilities. You know, members are transferring from league to league. You know, they need to understand what the true mission is and why they're joining. You know, when we talk about the league, when we, you know, create our websites, our materials, everything that we do needs to be synced up to what our mission is. And that has to be at the forefront of how we uh, talk about the league from the very beginning. I think it's important not only to talk about who we are, 
but also who were not. And I think I see Kristen from the Junior League of Portland, Oregon. Would you mind sharing your recruitment story? Kristen has a great story um, about how the Junior League of Portland sort of identified some challenges with their recruiting and then made some really positive changes that are now seeing some results. Would you mind sharing that with us? So we started talking at recruitment. Um, we'll have people stand up and they'll tell a little story about something meaningful that is happening to them in the league and we'll use some of these as the framework for that story, like I was at a membership event, um, a social event, and I met who is now my best friend, and we created this project together, and now we've gone on to do this thing in the league. But we just started talking about the league as a place where we develop women who then go out into the community and are civic leaders. And we stopped talking about volunteering. We stopped talking about the direct service. We and not that we stop talking about volunteering, but for I think a lot of people, when you say we volunteer, people think that means at the food bank or it's like a direct service thing, right? Like people don't have volunteering in their heads as meaning we show up and we're at meetings and we work on projects. They, they have this very specific idea of what volunteering is. So we just kind of stopped using the word. We had set ourselves a goal three years ago, because this has been a long-term process for us. We started about four years ago. And years two and three, we had set ourselves a goal to keep about 70% of our provisional members and have those transfer into first-year actives. And year two, we hit about 75%. Year three, we hit somewhere just above 80%. And I was saying I just got the numbers before I came to conference, and for this year, and I literally s wrote the woman back. I was like, this, this, can't, this isn't right. <laughs> it was 97% of our provisionals were transferring into a first year active role. For those who were eligible, they were, they were st they're staying. And they're staying for a long time. We're keeping them initially because we're giving them what we promised them during the recruitment process. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I love that story. I mean, we've obviously, Chris and I have talked a lot about this, but in our, some of our initial conversations, what I loved about her story is they're being very bold at their recruitment events. You know, they're saying things like, you know, if you're looking for a direct service organization and that's all you're looking for, this is probably isn't for you. And I think that's okay. I think we need to become more comfortable understanding that the Junior League is not necessarily for everyone. We are looking for women who identify with our mission. Sometimes we get a little caught up in the numbers, right? You know, we set goals for ourselves. We need to recruit X amount of members in this upcoming class. And I'm all about goals. You know, I have a sales background as well as a membership background, so I'm all for that. But don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, I'd rather have you, let's say, recruit 50 members who will stick around because they're really dialed into the mission versus re recruiting 100 members where 50% are out the door year two because it's not, it's not for them or it's not what they expected. So I know those are sort of, a, 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 that's a shift in conversation, right? A shift in philosophy. We've been so focused in some cases on hitting those target numbers that I think we've unintentionally brought in some members that probably weren't the right fit for us. So let's talk more about messaging. So everyone should have a 30 second elevator speech. And I know that that sounds a bit cheesy. I did um, visit the Junior League of Wilmington, Delaware, and I attended one of their GMMs. And one thing that they did was so great was they walked through with their entire membership at the GMM how to develop their 30 second elevator speech. And it was really successful. And then they um, had them do some role playing where they then developed it, then they practiced it. And so they each walked away with, in writing, what their elevator speech was. And it was on brand, on mission, targeted. You understood what it meant. And so I thought that was really amazing. So if you have questions about how to do that, I would reach out to the Junior League at Wilmington, Delaware. They did a great job. Create handouts that clearly articulate the mission and what the unique factor is. Um, we have launched a recruitment toolkit. I mentioned this before. It launches today. And I'll give you more information on where to find it. But we are providing a brochure. I'll show you at the end. So that is something that is out of the box, ready to go, that you can use after you leave here today. Um, so we'll talk more about that later. I encourage you, conduct an audit of all your communication channels, including your website, newsletter, social media, everything. Each time I visited a league or each time I'm getting ready to speak with a league, the first thing I do is I go on your website and I click on the membership section. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, okay, membership, this is what's required. That's all it says. And it's a list of requirements. 
And I'm thinking, okay, so a prospective member, the first thing they're going to do when they think about joining your league is they're gonna go right to your website. And if the first thing they see is just a list of requirements, I don't think they're gonna understand what that value proposition is and why they would even join, right? So take a look at everything. That's what they're going to look at when they start exploring membership. Lisa. We talked about benefits of membership. Mm -hmm. So even to our members currently, uh, the board put out a letter to retain saying, thank you for your years of service. Your men membership benefits you this way. Right. And we did, so when we're recruiting, we're starting to talk about the benefits of mm -hmm. our membership, not what we need you to do to be a part of Junior League. Exactly, I think you hit the nail on the head. Speak to the benefits first versus talking about the requirements first. Um, and for those, and Lisa is one of the leagues, Evansville, that is participating in the new membership model, we are definitely uh, moving to a much different model for those who are taking on that challenge and moving forward with that change. Um, so that would shift. So, you know, think very uh, hard about how your different audiences are going to receive your messaging. You know, I also check out the pictures and everything when I'm looking at your websites. And you know, in some cases, I'm seeing a good variety of like women in the community doing work, they're at meetings, they're, they're doing all sorts of things. And then there's you know, stuff intermittent in between there with, with the fun part, right? Don't just talk about the work. It's this fine balance, right? We're talking about the fact that you will be able to develop your civic leadership skills, but you'll do it with like-minded women and have a good time and meet some friends along the way, right? It's not just one or the other. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about information sessions. Part of the reason is that there is a resource, a guide that I created. It's part of the recruitment toolkit and you can watch it at your leisure. It's less than 10 minutes where I go into pretty detailed information about how to organize it. But I think location is very important. Obviously, people need to be able to find it. It needs to pop up in your GPS feed because everybody's using that. So if it's hard to find, don't choose it. I think the point I really wanna make here about information sessions is be inclusive. So what do I mean by that? So you wanna send the right message. So. I would almost suggest in some cases, if you don't have a headquarters, you could host it with a community partner at their office. That really shows the partnerships that you have in the community, things like that. So just, just I, my suggestion is to be mindful when you're, when you're thinking through this. And we already talked a little bit about story selling. And what I mean by this is, you know, tell the stories of the women, the members of your league that used their skills and then went out into the community and started a nonprofit or ran for office or, and get a quote from them where they credit the skills they learned at the league, being able to get them there. You all have these members, each and every one of you. And I visited the Junior League of Sarasota. They did an amazing job with this piece. They told stories of like three women in their community who were rock stars, who credited their abilities in the beginning to the work they did at the league. So I thought that was amazing. So misconceptions, you gotta be ready for those. People are gonna ask you tough questions. So be prepared to answer the tough questions. You know, be intentional. I kinda already alluded to this before. You know, if you meet someone at an information session and you're just, you're, you're pretty sure that she's just not the right fit because she's not really interested in, in building her civic leadership skills. She's, you know, not, you know, she's just not exhibiting any sort of, she's not asking the right questions. It just doesn't seem like the right fit. I'm not sure I would follow up with her after to try to recruit her. I would let that, that prospect go. And I think that goes back to what we were talking about before is it's okay that it's not for everybody, right? And I know that's, this is a bit of a conversation shift. I don't think we've talked about this before. But again, it's, we have to sort of get away from trying to just fill the numbers and think about who our member really is. So the Junior League of Omaha, they, you know, after they conduct their information sessions, they follow up with every person who attended via phone, email, and they will contact them until they hear a yes or no. And they recruited a class of, I think, 90. Now I'm sort of contradicting myself with this whole numbers thing, but they had really great success in, in, in recruiting members because they followed up. They were very tactical, I and mean, they have great systems in place. Go ahead, Lisa. It's not something that we're exercising Evansville, but it's something that I definitely, through the rollout process, feel that it's something we could be talking about in the future. Mm -hmm. The follow-up isn't necessarily, if our organization is truly an organization to empower women, 
because someone doesn't join Junior League doesn't mean we can't empower them. Mm -hmm. These are still women of our community. These are still women that can network and be a part of Junior League in other ways through their businesses, through their um, expertise. Mm -hmm. They can come in and train us. Mm -hmm. These are women that can attend our fundraisers, our social events, and mm -hmm. women that we need to either um, advocate for or with. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there might not be membership driven for our organization, but they are still women of our community that should be empowered by us. Okay, so intentional outreach. We talked a little bit about how there needs to be a method to the madness, right? So define your target. I think that as a junior league president, um, that each one of you should have a list of all of the other women's organizations within your community so that you know who's in your backyard, right? I think the next step is to start building relationships with those other women's organizations. Now, when I say start building relationships, you know, I think it starts off very informal. You reach out to the presidents of all these other, you know, women's organizations in your community and you invite them to get together, right? You're gonna get together at a Panera, you're gonna have coffee on a Monday at 8 a.m., whatever you're gonna decide. And you're each gonna go around and introduce yourselves, tell, talk about you know, your organization, what your goals are, what your focus is, so that everybody can start getting to know one another. And then I think you, know, you will be able to organize around commonality, not necessarily trying to get their members to join, right? If we approach them in this manner, then that's not gonna build a productive relationship long-term with these other organizations. I think you'll be very surprised what you may learn once you start reaching out to these other organizations. You may have much more in common with them than you initially think. So I would get started in this manner. Is there anyone in the room who has already done something like this that could share with us some success? Martha from Northern Virginia. So we've done a couple of things and really we've, re we've really started in the past year or two, so we're building on it. But recently we did, um, there was a young, young women's or young professionals organization and we did an event with them in terms of getting to know um, one of our members as part of them but we used it also as a recruitment event in terms of being able to get together with them but we've also done some things with some other um, women's organizations where we bring the leaders together as kind of a leadership group where they meet on I think so far they've been meeting like twice a year mm -hmm. in terms of talking about what's going on just sort of networking with mm -hmm. one another there could be a partnership that's formed. You could tackle an issue together because you think it would be more successful doing it together versus alone. So these are options that I think you can explore. I think we have another comment back here. Amy Ringu from Daytona Beach, Junior League of Daytona Beach. This year we had a um, backpack initiative and we partnered with Jack and Jill of America, which is a, I think a predominantly African-American civic organization. And it was a fantastic partnering and we think we may have uh, started a, a good relationship and we recruited some new members um, and it was it was actually really exciting win-win for everybody great that's awesome perfect right here I'm Libby from Lubbock and I met with our YWCA our mayor volunteer center and literacy Lubbock and just started a dialogue telling them what we're involved in and seeing if there's any chance for partnership if they saw any weaknesses that we <coughs> needed to address and they gave us some phenomenal feedback and is real valuable and so we're updating our website our external marketing pieces and all of our social media just because of the feedback we got but then we've also strengthened volunteer opportunities for our memberships and their organizations hi good morning I'm from Atlanta one of the points that I think it's really key it's taking audit of the different groups and skills that the women in your league have mm -hmm. and where they're where they're serving because mm -hmm. yes they're members of the league yep. but they're ambassadors for the league when they're outside mm -hmm. and serving at work or in different capacities mm -hmm. and i've seen this a lot you know i'm a member of um aka and i serve in, and that's another different service group mm -hmm. but if you're able to take stock of the mm -hmm. membership that you have you're able to see that that is easier to have conversations yep. and there's also intel mm -hmm. that we can also bring in helping to have those conversations yep. where it seems real and authentic as opposed to you coming to me to fill a quota mm -hmm. or coming to have just yep. because you want a partnership that's can right. help have those difficult conversations exactly i think you make an excellent point i couldn't agree more so thank you and are we creating the right messaging the right um, materials to get the right member. So, you know, when I have this on the screen, I'm curious how many of you 
um, feel like currently your recruitment efforts are, are on point. You know, you're recruiting on mission, your prospective members walk away understanding who the junior league is and what you're all about. How many of you think you're, you're on target? Okay, so that explains the large room. Okay, so two to three people. Okay, I just wanted to see where we were. Okay, so given what I've said so far, is this resonating with you? Do you feel, okay, good, okay. All right, so I made my point then. Onboarding, you've worked really hard. You got your messaging on point, you've created your materials, you've got your talking points, you're doing a great job when you're at your events recruiting your members. But then you get them in, right? And that experience also needs to be on point with the mission. So we're gonna talk about rapid onboarding versus provisional classes. Now I know most of you have provisional classes. I just went through one, so I am fresh off the boat. What I wanna talk about is, you know, I think there's an opportunity to maybe tweak what we're doing in terms of the onboarding piece with these provisional classes. You know, I think that, you know, women are coming to us from various life stages. We're attracting women that are coming to us from various life stages, different types of experience, et cetera, et cetera. And so let's not bring them through an experience that may or may not be right for them. And so I think there's some exploring to be done here. And I think Lisa from Evansville, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the things you're exploring? Because I think that might be better. This coming year, we're prototyping into a two provisional class to transition so we don't like shock current members. And if we're going to recruit 12 months, we need to do 12 months intake. Yeah, no, I think this is, a, <laughs> no, this is great. I mean, this is, this is the type of stuff that leagues are prototyping because we know we need to go in this direction. We need to be more flexible, more nimble, and not just with the active experience, but with this provisional experience as well. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, so we've talked about brand messaging, right? And you'll have to look through all your channels and develop some stuff. We've also talked about intentional outreach and meaningful onboarding. I think all three of these pieces have to be in place to really set you up for success. If you just have, going back to what I kind of opened with, if you just have the messaging, but then you are not delivering on the promise once they are in, that's also not gonna get you the retention that you're looking for. So it comes from all three pieces being aligned. Okay, so I've talked about this recruitment toolkit. You must be wondering what it is. So um, it launched today, um, and there are a few things in there, uh, one of which is the brochure that I talked about, which is out of the box and ready to go. You probably can't see this in the back, but what does this say on the front? Hi. Very inclusive, right? We're saying hi. So you're gonna open this, it's a trifold. And on this page right here, and y'all can look at this, it's in the app, it's on the website, I'll tell you how to get it. But it says, if you want to develop your leadership skills, do good, make friends while making a difference, be inspired, and change your community and the world, then join us. And then you open it up and there's some additional dialogue in here. So we created this specifically for you. If you don't have something, now you do. If you have something already that you think needs to be tweaked, that's fine too. Um, there are two versions of this. There's one that's out of the box, it's right here. There's another version that you can modify slightly with the name of your league and a couple other tidbits here and there. So you'll have both options right out of the box. So um, the additional thing, so there is a PowerPoint presentation. So for your info sessions, and again, it's just something to get you started. You'll obviously tweak it. Um, we've included talking points, suggestions, phrases, how to organize the flow of the presentation. It's all in there, ready to go. So you guys can tweak it and use it immediately. Um, there is also a checklist for diversity and inclusion, making sure you're keeping in mind all those things to keep in mind so that you ensure you're creating an inclusive environment so that people, any woman who's, who our mission resonates with will want to join the league. Um, there is also a video on how to organize an info session. I think I mentioned that before. It's less than 10 minutes. Watch it. You can hear my voice for nine and a half minutes. Um, so I walk you through, you know, really how to make an, or, uh, an information se session successful. So please check it out. And then there's also a one sheet on social media tips and tricks. And I know somebody asked about millennial, uh, so what was it? Let me, like, okay, perfect. So targeted millennial marketing. So. I'm gonna come at this a bit general, but this, this is a point that I wanna make. So 
we know that millennials, from all the research, if you read it out there, there's tons of literature out there. Um, the, the next generations, they are used to a customized, personalized experience. We know this. Think about how they shop. Think about what, what they do. And some of you in this room, a lot of you are probably millennials, actually. Um, but the generation next, after millennials, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges here. And so for us to attract um, these groups that have been accustomed to um, instant gratification, you know, personalizing their experiences, putting them through this regimented, you know, class and requiring them to do a long list of requirements, they're like, what is this, you know, in some cases? So I think we really have to think about, um, you know, the membership structure and the experience. And I think there's, you know, we've talked about a number of ways that you can do that. Um, but I think that it starts by becoming more member centric and more member, you know, more fluid. And so we were doing that through the model and through some of the things that you can do here today. So I know that's sort of a general answer to that question, but I think um, I think it's a viable solution. I think we're already seeing great success with the leagues that are participating and, and changing the experience. So um, I would leave you with that. So check out the recruitment toolkit. If you go on AJLI.org and you click on the resources tab, I think it's the fourth or fifth menu item down and it just says member recruitment. All that I mentioned is right there. It's also accessible via the app, so you can get it there too. Um, we will continually add to this toolkit. So we need you to tell us what's missing. What do you um, We are planning to translate into Spanish, so you will have that. Yeah. So that's, I don't have an ETA, but it's happening. So I'm committed. Um, so you'll have that. Um, any questions about the recruitment toolkit specifically? Yeah. Hi, Kimberly Hinkle, Junior League of Pueblo. I'm just curious, we have a smaller league, we're around 60 actives. Do most leagues have an actual quota? Do you aim for a certain amount of, of women? Do you do a cap on women? So do you say, well, we are a smaller league? We, we, what we usually do is anyone who wants to join, joins. We don't really have a cap, but I wonder if it's more manageable with having a cap. So I'm just curious if we say maybe 20 women, and then maybe it kind of brings more of junior league is special because they only accept 20 women a year, something like that. Okay. So I'm just well, curious. So a couple, there are different leagues doing different things, obviously. Some do have a cap. I don't think, though, necessarily that it's because of creating this whole special thing. I think it's more of a logistical thing. Um, you know, the, in some cases, their classes are getting so large, it is hard for them to onboard them successfully. So I think that's the reason there's more the cap, not, and, and I think we're trying to kind of move away from that whole exclusive thing, right? That's what we're, we're getting away from. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to cap it because logistically you want their experience to be positive. However, I think, again, going back to what we've been talking about this entire morning, you know, it's about recruiting the right members, right? So if you get 20 and they're fabulous and they're dialed in and excited to get started, that in some cases is better than getting 50 where you lose 30, you know, because then you're spending all this time and energy and whatnot with the revolving door situation where you could be spending that time elsewhere, moving the needle in the community, you know, training women, et cetera, et cetera. Hello, Bethany McRae from the Junior League of Memphis, and we are considered a large league. And when I joined, our provisional class was 154. And other than my small provisional group of 10, and we were um, put in there because we all lived in the same zip code, um, we really started to look at where are we dropping off. And because we had these large revolving door classes, we had to start something smaller. So we enacted affinity groups. And um, I head up a group and we have great success of recruitment because our affinity group members have made those secondary meaningful connections and our tax we are a wine group sorry um <laughs> but our um, tagline is no agenda just wine so most of the time we are there to get to know you amber as a person where do you work what are your aspirations what do you do in the community or what would you like to start doing and so that might be something to also think about is building that secondary relationship. Because I know if I'm thinking about leaving, Amber's not gonna let me leave. 
because we made that connection. You know, we have that bond and that's just another way to either retain or to use them as recruitment. And we host as an affinity group, we host a recruitment event and that's where a majority of our new provisionals are coming in this year. And then we also charged our members to create new affinity groups. We have an affinity group chair and you come to them. We have an entrepreneurs group as well. And so that has got a whole crew of ladies that are all in the community. They've all started their own businesses. And so now we all support each other. Perfect, thank you. So another just add on, um, there are some leagues who have um, implemented mentoring programs. We're talking about retention now. Um, AJLI has a mentoring toolkit that you can download from the resources tab or the resources library. Um, and for so they actually implemented a mentoring program and for those who have participated, they've seen 100% retention rate. So I think that one-on-one -on -one connection, that meaningful deep connection, that's what got them to stay. So I would definitely encourage uh, you guys to think about doing something like that. And it's not difficult to do. Um, I think what makes a mentoring program really successful versus one that may not be successful is the intentional matching process. If you randomly pair people up together, that will not be as successful as intentionally making those matches and taking the time to do that. It's at the beginning of the year or whenever you do it, doesn't have to be at the beginning of the year, but it's a one-time thing to make those matches and then they're off and running. So it's a small investment for a huge outcome, potentially. Hi, how are you? I'm from Atlanta, and in 2016, 2017, we went into a year-long program, and we welcomed in 400 new women to join. And it's been great, quite honestly. Um, it's been my child, my baby, for the last year. But one point that I really want to make is that the trainings are really important, but what we've seen is the hand the hands-on experiences that really allow our members to see the league's mission in action. So we've really tried to um, have monthly um, events where you can go and serve with our partners. You're actively working and getting involved in our fundraisers and saying that yes, the events are great, but these events are key because they help us serve Atlanta. And so I say that to say that, that let's not lose sight of the trainings that being in the classroom, but the hands-on experiences are really what help them bridge the gap and helps to reinforce what they're being taught in the classroom. So, to speak. so of the 400, we'll have about 383 who will continue on. We're very proud of that. So just one second, these are all really good points. I do want to kind of shift gears for just a second. We've talked a lot about engagement, right, and, and how that's a big piece of uh, retention, but I'm curious to hear how you all feel, you know, for because the majority of you are seems like need some shifting around when it comes to your recruitment messaging and your strategies. If you make these changes and if you get back on point with the mission and the brand and what we're all about, are you concerned that there's going to be some fallout from that, that you may lose members or not recruit large enough classes based on what you've budgeted for? Um, the reason I ask that question is, I think there's a possibility it may get worse before it gets better. If you have unintentionally moved away from who we are and what we're about, um, then you know there may be some women who joined who are gonna fall off now, because now they're getting it. You're driving it home, you're providing the experience, and it's not necessarily what they signed up for. So are you concerned about that? So I can actually speak to that. I would say when I first joined League about six years ago, we were recruiting to a social direct service club. And what would happen would we would, re would recruit about 20 women and then half would fall off. Um, and this was a thing that happened for probably about four years. And then I, three years ago, I would say, we changed our messaging to be this. And while we aren't recruiting 20 members, we're recruiting 10 and keeping about eight who are strong leaders within our organization. And so we, we might not have the numbers that we had, but our retention isn't as bad, and we have wonderful leaders and league members who are making us stronger. You know, you've been conditioned the, year over year to think you must meet this recruitment number, and so that may change a little bit, and those, those are discussions you'll have to have, you know, as a board. Um, you know, is this the way we want to go? We need to re maybe we need to rethink our strategy and understand that in the short term we may be in a rebuilding phase, and that might be okay. You know, I think um, to Missy's point, you know, she's 
she's recruiting smaller classes, but it's women that really, for the most part, want to be there. And I think that's really important. So I think there were some other questions. Yep, go ahead. You mentioned earlier that there's a, there's a new membership model that <laughs> some people are testing. Is there anything you're prepared to tell us today about that? Oh, I can talk about that all day. Just like a yes. Couple, <laughs> um, just a couple so of them. yeah, so I, thanks for the question. Um, so yes, there's an overall transformation rollout and there are three pieces. One of course is the membership transformation rollout. There is tons of information on our website so I can direct you there, but in the short term, um, we are moving, this new model moves away from requirements and instead uh, allows the member to commit to the league in a very different way. And it's, again, it is not commitment free and I wanna make that point. Um, so her experience would be much, much different, much more member centric, much more fluid, dependent upon what her upcoming year looks like. So she would have a voice and a choice, meaning she would be able to tell us through an interview that Lisa talked about, what she can realistically give for the upcoming year, and then what skills she's looking to build or give back, what her aspirations are, why did she come to the league, and then place her in a more meaningful way so that her expectations are met as well as the league's expectations. It's much more mutually beneficial. Do We, ha we have to have a relationship with our member or she's not gonna stay. So I know I'm giving you an extremely quick high, high level 411 on the membership model, but we have had, um, about 25 leagues roll it out so far. Um, membership kicked off later than IBCI and governance and management, and the leagues that are in process now, uh, we're hearing the success stories of all that's changed. Now, with all that said, change is messy, so this is never a perfect process. But the good news is, um, because leagues have gone before you, you're in a really good position now because we know where the potential pain points are. Hi, Julie from the Junior League of um, Racine. Are you guys gonna be at all the ODIs as the membership kind of maybe changing to a different rollout. Are you guys gonna be doing that at every ODI, doing a little track on that? So there is a membership track at every ODI. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't know if they were gonna all trying to, are they trying to get, are they trying to use that track as getting more information about that new rollout on that, or is it just more generalized more. membership? Um, so I think there's gonna topics. be some change to that content, and I think it will have more content focused on the actual membership transformation rollout than it has in the past, for sure. Hi, it's Marion from Hamilton, Burlington. So I'm really excited about what I'm hearing today. And we're a league that over the course of time, probably the last 15 years, we had a full year training, we had a twice a year training, we had a one day training, we had a come any time training. So this is really giving us some framework to work with mm -hmm. and stabilize us. So it, I think it's it's great and it's, no one has to figure it out yeah. next year. So, right. but because of where we've been and what we've been doing, we have a whole, we have a small league, but of the members that we have, they've been all over the map with the training. So this too, my thinking coming in was we're back to basics mm -hmm. um, this year. That's mm -hmm. what our program is really going to be about. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring our existing members up to speed. So this, we're gonna be able to, ca to capture everybody mm -hmm. all at one time. So I'm just maybe asking questions around your immediate thoughts on how we can integrate uh, general membership training with a new member training or provisional training. But we're so is it your question about how to provide training league-wide to integrate all, all your members? To bring everybody up to, to speed. To bring everybody up to speed. You know, I think, and how large did you say your league is? 23 actives? Okay, so yeah, you're small. Well, the good news is for you that's way easier because you've got 23 actives. What I like about what you're saying is you know where you are. I think each league needs to really be honest about where you are right now and take a hard look at your situation and be frank about it. I think sometimes I hear stories about leagues that are, oh, our recruitment is fantastic. We're recruiting like 250 members a year and it's great and it's wonderful and that is great. But I think um, taking a harder look at, okay, but are those members staying and are they the right member and does it need to be 250? The question was, we're talking about these transformation rollouts. She's asking if poll leagues have participated in the membership transformation rollout because we're talking about these one-on-one -on -one interviews and if you've got like a thousand members 
how do you do all that? Um, I'm going to hand this over to Bethany for a second. Bethany again from Memphis. So yes, poll leagues are getting on board with the new membership rollout. Yes, it is going to be challenging, but you know what? We're up for a challenge. And it's all about messaging. So when we rolled out community and we rolled out governance, we had the town halls, we had it in an e-newsletter, we were coming to you one-on-one, -on -one. we were meeting with committees, we were coming to affinity groups and letting them know, don't be scared, it's okay. We have a new membership model in place. We are going through the pilot program, so we will start that. And in the essence of having people sign up themselves, uh, we ask for volunteers. So we're going to do volunteering through the pilot program this year, get feedback, talk about it, converse with Amber, um, and then we will figure out where we're going to go and how we're going to implement that with everyone. Now, we do have sustainer involvement. That is key. Um, and she's actually here in the next chapter. But you know, we can go, again, at length about this. But yes, poll leagues are getting on board, not all of them, but most of them. And we can report back um, in 2018. Um, about what's going to happen with us. But yes, we do have poll leagues participating. Okay, so I know we talked about a lot. What other questions? I Hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm from Charleston. And it, I already had this question, and Bethany just kind of touched on it. You know, we're doing all these rollouts, like the transformation. And in Charleston, we just did the split, and then we did a dues increase. And boy, was that, you know, blood boiling everywhere. And we've done the town halls, and we do the information dumps. And I just wanted to know from your standpoint, from poll leagues and other leagues, like what do you think about too much change at one time? And is there membership fallout or dissatisfaction? And do you just lose those members along the way and it wasn't for us and she parted ways and we're not gonna chase her for it? So just some overall thoughts. I love this question. Okay, so change, too much change at once. So society is changing at a rapid pace. The needs in the community change at a rapid pace. We've gotta come up with a way to embrace this. Now I do respect your question though, right? Um, you don't want to you know, throw them off a cliff and, and have it not work out. So I do get this question frequently. Is it too much change based on the other things that we have rolled out recently? Keep in mind, when you sign up for the membership transformation rollout, it is a three-year phased approach. And the first year, nothing changes. Your placements stay the same. Your current membership process stays the same. Nothing changes until the beginning of year two. And in year two, it's just with your pilot group of let's say 30 women. So then you're not rolling this out league-wide until the beginning of year three, especially if you're a larger league. So with that said, if you started now, the general membership's not gonna feel it for two to three years. So that's why you know I encourage you, if you're thinking about it, to get on board sooner rather than later, because it does take some time. This is massive change. You know, We walk you through all the organizational infrastructure that you're going to need to put in place to make it work. And I really wanna stress that last point because there have been leagues that have thought that creating a member compact and going to no requirements was a solution and they were just gonna do that. Leagues that have done that have now signed up for the rollout because there are other pieces of the puzzle that you need to think about and you have to put in place in order to make it work. And so I also don't want to send the message today that the member compact is the solution. It's a part of the solution. It is much bigger than just getting rid of requirements and creating a member compact. So, you know, we came together today because we wanted to talk about retention tied to the recruitment piece on the front end. This is just one piece, but this conversation kind of went in another direction because there are so many pieces to the retention experience, right? To the membership experience that creates, you know, a positive experience, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you all for coming today. Please reach out to me and thanks so much for participating.